So, hello everybody. So, it's the last session for today, probably. Um, I'd like uh, to uh, introduce myself very shortly. So, my name is Markus Kürtler, and I'm from B1 Systems. And I'm here with my valued colleague, Michel. Yeah, hi, folks. Um, my name is Michel. I'm working for also for the B1 Systems as a cloud architect. Yeah, thanks, Michel. And our title for the session today is Build Your Own Hyperscaler. And what this actually means, I will tell then later. So I just want to give you a little overview about our agenda, so what we will talk about. First of all, we make a little introduction of our company, what we are doing. Um, then I want to explain a bit the vision behind Build Your Own Hyperscaler, what it really means for us. Um, then I will give a little introduction into the OpenStack solution, OSISM. We'll explain what the Surain Cloud Stack is. This is maybe very interesting for the European colleagues here. And also we'll introduce SAP Gardener and how everything fits together, basically. And at the end, we have a very nice session from Michel um, to give you some field experience from customer projects that we did in the past or are currently are doing. So let's start with B1 Systems. B1 Systems is a consulting company. Um, it's mainly active in the uh, DACH region, so that means Germany, Austria, and Switzerland, but we're also doing international projects. Um, it has been founded in 2004. We have around 150 employees, um, which are mostly developers, um, trainers, and consultants. Um, we started actually with Linux consulting, um, doing um, consulting, um, development, training, and support. And in, since 2011, we are also in the, in the cloud space active. So with OpenStack, we're working already since 2011. Um, and uh, yeah, basically, um, OpenStack is one of our main focus areas right now. And of course, everything which is around that. So um, also Ceph and all its services. And we are doing basically projects really from the beginning to the end um, and doing the, the whole OpenStack lifecycle. So we are doing the planning, we are doing the architecture, the implementation, and then also um, afterwards when the systems are live, um, we have managed services where we provide uh, for our customers operation services. And we have several models here. One model is to do it permanently. The other model is to do it just for a certain amount of time and then hand it over to the customer, doing trainings for the customer and things like that. Um, just like to mention that we are not just uh, doing OpenStack, we are also doing um, other cloud solutions as well. So, um, um, namely Kubernetes here, for example, but also some um, yeah, more commercial open source solutions like um, SUSE Ranger, OpenShift, and we also have people that are certified for the big hyperscalers. Yeah, we also have a lot of partnerships, um, for example, with um, Red Hat, with Canonical, with SUSE, and a couple of other ones. And um, of course, since we are so long in the market, a broad portfolio of different customers in various industries, basically. Just want to name a couple of them here that also are internationally known because some of them or many of them are just in the Dach region uh, a name. For example, Airbus Industries, um, Deutsche Telekom, Audi, SAP. Um, yeah, so these are the more, most important customers here on that slide that have an international brand as well. Yeah, and with that, I'd like already to dive into um, a little architecture comparison. This is a very simplified slide, or architecture, of course, um, but it already shows that there are similarities between the hyperscalers, so the big hyperscalers like AWS or Azure or the uh, Google Cloud Platform, and OpenStack. So in that slide here, you see um, here on the left side um, an hyperscaler architecture. You have typically your self-service portal and APIs. Then you have um, at least two regions. Most hyperscalers have, have more than two regions. You have availability, uh, availability zones in there. And within the availability zones, you have always compute, network, and storage. And this is designed for massive scale-out. And with OpenStack, it's basically the same. If you build it like that, you have um, a shared service um, with, open, with the OpenStack APIs and the OpenStack dashboard. You have, um, can have one or more data centers, which you can refer as regions. And within the regions, we have um, availability zones. And in the availability zones, again, we have compute, storage, and network. But the cool thing is, with OpenStack, we have a much bigger flexibility and versatility. Uh, so we don't have just one hypervisor. Um, we can basically choose any hypervisor we want. So KVM is default, but we can also use VMware, of course, and all other um, open source hypervisors. 
The same with storage. I've uh, mentioned here Ceph and uh, NetApp, but of course all other storage solutions which are supported by OpenStack work as well. And the same with network. Here I just named the most prominent ones, so um, Sonic and OVN. O uh, yeah, OVN. And uh, yeah, this is basically also really flexible because you can basically tie everything together. This, of course, creates also challenges. This versatility creates challenges, and uh, Michelle will talk later about some of these challenges we usually have if we try to puzzle everything together for our customers. Um, yeah, everything is designed for massive scale out. What we also see is um, that we have customers now that um, yeah, have already experienced this with clouds because they went first into the hyperscalers and now figure out, well, because of several reasons, um, one is data protection, another one is because they figured out that the promises from the hyperscalers weren't fulfilled, that they um, build up their own private cloud deployments in their own data centers. Um, and some of these customers actually are coming from VMware because VMware is, yeah, for whatever reason, um, uh, uh, yeah, the customers like to move to open source software, want to um, uh, give this a, that a chance, and then OpenStack is a very um, good start for that. This, one's, uh, this slide here is, a, is the same slide as you have seen before, but just one zoom level um, zoomed in. So it's basically the same. We have here again the two data centers, um, which you can refer as regions. We have our availability zones. Within the availability zones, we have our compute nodes, and um, we have also host aggregates here. And uh, we have local services like, for example, Cinder or um, Neutron. Um, or Glance, and we have shared services like, for example, Keystone or um, the OpenStack dashboards, Horizon or Skyline. And yeah, this is um, an uh, architecture that I've seen, by the way, in other presentations um, here on the Open Infra Summit. Um, yeah, um, very similar. So, for example, the um, uh, guy from Samsung had a slide which showed a very similar architecture. I think also the people from Stack IT had a slide that showed a very similar architecture. So this is basically the way to go. Of course, it's very simplified. In, in reality, it's much more complex. Just to give you an overview um, how this can be designed. Now I'd like to introduce um, a solution that's called OSISM. It's an OpenStack distribution. And I have to say that it's not a V1 solution. Instead, OSISM is a separate company. Um, V1 Systems is an implementation partner for OSISM. I've chosen that solution here for this talk because it fits very well into our story, build your own hyperscaler, because the solution is really built for massive scale. So it can be used also for medium deployments, but it can really also be used for really large um, OpenStack deployments. Um, it's 100 person open source software. It's, uh, the deployment framework is completely containerized. It's based on uh, Kola Ansible um, and provides basically all OpenStack services, so compute network storage and all variations that um, OpenStack uh, supports. It's also the reference um, implementation of the Surin Cloud Stack. And what the Surin Cloud Stack is, I will explain um, later. Um, if we talk about massive scale, we very often come also to the point where we say, OK, um, it's not just enough to have one cloud, but uh, customers also want to spawn workloads across multiple clouds. So these are typical hybrid cloud scenarios. And this is um, not directly possible with OpenStack, but um, with the um, Kubernetes layer on top, in this case here, it's the Gardener managed Kubernetes platform it's possible to do exactly that. So we have a layer here sitting on top, providing Kubernetes, and therefore um, container workloads can run there, um, which can um, spawn across multiple clouds. So we have here on the left side, the private cloud deployment with OSIM, and on the right side, the hyperscalers. Um, to show this a bit in more detail, um, how this basically works, also very simplified, of course, we have um, here on the top, um, the Gardener control cluster, um, this control cluster spawns so-called seed clusters for each cloud, one seed cluster, and these seed clusters again spawn so-called shoot clusters. And within the shoot clusters, you can run your actual cloud workload. And the cool thing is this can be managed centrally um, via APIs or web interface, and um, it really, um, you can think about it, it really expands into a cloud. So you can really do a massive scale out there by just starting more and more clusters. And the good thing is you can also um, shrink in that uh, deployment again, so you can kill that clusters. And this is very useful for uh, workloads that have 
peak demands. So um, many workloads have maybe um, at the end of the months for demand for um, much more compute resources, for example, and with this solution you can really go from your private cloud, for example, into hyperscalers, use it temporarily, um, yeah, pay, pay some money for it, of course, and after you did it uh, not anymore, you can throw it away. And um, just to bring everything together, just to give you a little bit um, an, an information how this works together, so OSISM um, plus um, the, the Kubernetes Gardener is basically a full stack. Um, and it can be used for traditional workloads, um, which means um, yeah, old PET workloads or um, workloads that are somewhere between PET and cattle workloads. So close to cloud native, but not really. Also pet workloads are typically, for example, some, some old Oracle databases or um, yeah, what, um, some, some Microsoft um, Active Directory, for example. These are pet workloads. Um, we have workloads somewhere in, the, in the, somewhere in the middle, for example, SAP workloads, SAP NetWeaver, or SAP HANA is somewhere in the middle. And cloud native workloads are usually running containerized. And um, with the Kubernetes, this is possible as well. Um, like I already said, it's a Suvain, there's a reference implementation for the um, Suvain cloud stack. And just to give you a little uh, introduction into the Suvain cloud stack and what it actually is, so um, there is a project from the European Union that's called GaiaX. And the idea is to build an alternative for the big hyperscalers. But the idea is not to build a new big organization um, that has just one new big hyperscaler. The idea is more to connect little um, hyperscalers together. And this um, is being done by the so-called Gaia-X Federation services. But you can imagine if you have such a complex architecture here, um, you need a lot of standardization. And so everything is standardized. Um, and this is basically across all layers. And for the um, most um, layers down, so the platform as a service layer and the infrastructure as a service layer, um, this is um, combined. And um, this architecture for that um, both layers is called the Suvin Cloud Stack. So the Suvin Cloud Stack is the architecture. The reference, reference implementation that implements that um, architecture um, is done by the OSISM OpenStack distribution. So if this really lifts up this Gaia X, um, it um, was last week on the SCS summit in Berlin. Um, I think this will be really a great thing. Probably at the moment I would say it looks really, really promising. Yeah, and with that, I'm at the end of my part and will hand over to Michelle, who is then doing the yeah, field experience part. Yeah, thank you, Marcus, for the overview. Um, yeah, as you already said, um, we have the problems, or the problem if we go to the customer who wants OpenStack. We are facing several problems. Um, and I've tried to, to draw it as a puzzle, as an unsolved architecture puzzle. Um, the first piece of our puzzle, oh, as you see, there are already two solved and two unsolved. The two unsolved is the first one is the network. And uh, probably you would agree, network deploying on the customer side is sometimes quite challenging. We have several options to deploy a network. For example, default, I would say default network, but floating IP addresses, external stuff, overlay network, that's it. Then of course we can have um, multiple provider networks connected to our hypervisor so that the instances are directly connected to a corporate LAN, let's say. And um, the BGP option, where the network node announces over a BGP speaker to a layer up, um, switch, security gateway, router, um, the networks which are configured by a customer on the OpenStack. And of course, third party option, SDN software, whatever it is. So, Network is always challenging, it's always a piece of puzzle that we need to solve with the customer directly. So we don't have an, a master plan for a network, let's say. The other one is the storage, of course. Who runs OpenStack with Ceph? Just three, two, yeah. Who runs OpenStack with NetApp, for example? One, two, okay, at least. Three, oh. Three, really? Okay. Um, so we have several options, of course, for the network. We can go with the Ceph, as I said, um, if a customer decides, hey, I want to go with Ceph because I don't have 
and storage that fits to our OpenStack cloud. We have to figure out what kind of hardware he has. Um, if not, we have to configure hardware. It takes a process. Um, if the customer wants to integrate his existing storage, um, for example, like a NetApp, can we have credentials to access the net the, to um, access the NetApp storage, or we only have an NFS share, or 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 some other kind of storage? So, storage is another piece that we need to solve with the customer on site. Also no master plan for that. We have a master plan for our deployment and our images. Um, deployment. Um, as Marcus already mentioned, we are using OSYSM. OSYSM, um, open, open Source Infrastructure Service Manager, which is um, a wrapper around multiple open source projects, as you already mentioned, Kala Ansible, Ceph Ansible, and some other internal APIs. Um, we start always with a configuration repository that we're storing in Git, customer side, public side, or well, public is not a bad one, um, or on our Git. Color Ansible has some configuration options. Self Ansible has some configuration options. All these options are stored in that Git repository. And with that, we can start um, with the seed node here. And the seed node can be a laptop, a virtual machine, a piece of hardware, and in some cases also the controller itself, but later that. Um, and the seed node just powers up some bunch of containers. So the manager is, I would say, 10 to 12 containers. Um, Docker Ansible, uh, Color Ansible, Ceph Ansible, some internal stuff, and as you see, networks and Bifrost for the deploy mechanism. Um, if the manager is up and running, we can go to the next step, deploying the controller, the hardware. We can use, or at least we have two and almost three options to deploy the hardware. The first one is, of course, we do it manually. Spin up an ESO of the uh, management, install an Ubuntu system, and that's it. And then we can roll out the next step. And the second option is to use buy first, to bootstrap or, or to install the controller computes over Pixie with the Ubuntu uh, OS. And there's a new option, which is, I'd say, a technical preview. That's a um, pre-built um, image. What we, can uh, what we can fire up over Redfish, for example, and install the controller computes over that specific image and report back the status of the installation progress, or status, to a netbox. And with the netbox, we are using the netbox as an inventory for our Ansible rollout for our Ansible playbooks. That's one option. The other one is the traditional Ansible inventory over text files. With netbox, we have several options or benefits, features. The first one is we can generate the inventory for our environment. And the second one is you can configure in the netbox the whole environment. That means compute storage with MAC addresses, IP addresses, switch ports, serial numbers, DNS entries, and all the stuff that you need or you want to store in, the, in that netbox. Netbox is more or less a config DB. And with this information, we are able to generate the switch configuration. So, and with that, we are able to move a host dynamically from one role to another one. Like in this example here, we can use this one, this node here as a compute in the beginning. And if we're seeing, oh, the demand is more like we need bare metal workloads for Ironic, we can reassign over the netbox with a simple tag that this node is an Ironic node now. Start the rollout process from the manager the node gets cleaned up and registered on the controller, so on the OpenStack itself, that is 
this one, this node is now an ironic node, for example. Um, if the OS is installed, last step is, of course, call Ansible, roll out all the OpenStack services. And yeah, after that, we are able to start workloads on Ironic, for example, or bare metal workloads for an Ironic node or on an instance, for example. The next one is how to get images into our OpenStack environment. And with that, we have a build pipeline. It also starts with the Git repository. The Git, respo Git repository stores config information for the specific image. Easy way is to, or the easiest way is to go upstream ubuntu.com, download the uh, OpenStack images, upload it, and that's it. I would say that fit for 60 to 80 percent of our customers and the rest needs custom images because security-wise or they want to add a specific software or they want a nightly builds of, an, of the image, patches and all stuff. And with that, we can add custom scripts, custom configuration parts to the Git repository and over a CI-CD, we can trigger the build process. We can use Kiwi build, for example, or MKOZ, which is part of the SystemD collection, or MDT. But MDT is a completely different story. That's only for Windows build services. Um, for MDT, you need the dedicated Windows host and all the stuff that makes it a bit tricky. Um, if the build process is ready, we have the images. Um, and the images are uploaded over the CI CD into our OpenStack, of course. And yeah, with that, I'd like to hand over to Marcos again. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, I think with that, all the pieces are connected together, basically, so the puzzle is closed in the end. Um, yeah, as you can see, here is still a little hole in this little puzzle, so this stands for all the things that are still not working after that. <laughs> which is, of course, always the case. Usually in our projects, when we do it, um, before we do the go live, there is an extensive testing. There are also extensive trainings then to the end users that uh, are operating that or using that as end users or operating that. Um, but um, as always, it's IT technology. Nothing is really working perfect. But in the end, um, when everything really is um, going stable, usually then um, we hand over these operations then to the actual yeah, local teams to continue with the operations. Yeah, with that, um, we are at the end of our talk. Um, thank you for your participation. Are there any questions? So, no questions, okay, then thank you very much. Uh, no. no. Any other question from anybody? Oh. Yes. Oh. <laughs> uh, uh, sorry. Thanks for the talk. Yeah. I just wanted to to hear how modular the different parts of is. So, for example, you said that the, the reference implementation is Cola for actually deploying OpenStack. How easy would it be to like? run the Bifrost part and the Netbox part, but then utilize, for example, OpenStack Ansible or something else for, for actually deploying the parts that are OpenStack, for example. It's part of the SCS, so it's... Um, yeah, exactly. So this is basically part of the of the architecture. Yeah. So this is yeah. basically a given in the end. Yeah. Um, of course, technically it would be possible, um, but um, like the architecture is really pre-given, that's the only option. Okay, thanks. Yeah. That's an open source project. Yeah. So feel free. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Any other question? Okay, then. Okay. Have a great evening. <laughs> Thank you very much for attending. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.